So under the heading of substance use disorders, mm -hmm. one of the most common ones is ethanol, um, but we'll also talk about toxic alcohols. So when somebody is intoxicated with ethanol, and we see this all the time, <laughs> yeah, we, we know that ethanol intoxication is dangerous yeah. when they basically are not breathing very well. And that respiratory depression can be a very problematic. But when someone's really intoxicated with ethanol, they shouldn't be profoundly acidotic. They shouldn't have acidosis. If they are acidotic, think about other things that might be causing them to be altered. That depressed level of consciousness that you see that you're chalking up entirely to ethanol toxicity in the acidotic patient, there's probably something else going on. Right. So make that as a clue. Now, Alcohol withdrawal, ethanol withdrawal, we see all the time. And knowing the specifics of how ethanol withdrawal works is certainly something that they could ask about. We know that people can get shaky. That happens pretty early on. They may have visual hallucinations. They may have seizures anywhere from 6 to 48 hours out from their uh, alcohol withdrawal. Remember that we treat this with another GABA agonist, benzodiazepines as our, as our cornerstone of treatment. And when you use the word or the phrase DTs or delirium tremens, sort of one of the hallmarks marks of that is someone who all of a sudden is confused. Yeah. Now, we see a lot of alcohol withdrawal, and a lot of people who are withdrawn are not confused. They are having symptoms, they are having autonomic instability, they're having agitation, they're having those kinds of things. But when they really don't know where they are anymore, and that's mm -hmm. truly attributable to their alcohol withdrawal, that's DTs, right? And, that, and that's an important distinction because it's a totally different entity. Yeah. DTs is, you're now, it's a whole different thing. It's not just I'm, the, I'm withdrawing and shaky and crabby and exactly. sweaty and I don't feel good. This is a whole different thing yeah. and it's treated much differently. And some people call withdrawal DTs. Wrong. It is not, that's wrong. So no, see this difference, right? Um, it can come along with some hallucinations. They may have some fever, tachycardia, hypertension. And really a lot though, right? So this, yes. this is things, you know, not, not just a little bit, things get yeah. kind of out of control. And they're really sick. Mm -hmm. They're really sick. We give them fluids and don't forget about these things, the thiamine the multivitamins, magnesium, folate, benzodiazepines, and they are coming into an ICU type setting. Um, there are these specific medical entities that go on, go along with this type of withdrawal, like Wernicke's encephalopathy. Mm. Remember all these neurological things that can go yeah. along with Wernicke's. They can have an oculomotor crisis. They may have a cranial nerve six palsy, which is when they have a lateral rectus palsy, nystagmus, ataxia, confusion, these neuro, very profound neurological problems. And then there's Korsakoff psychosis, which is when they can't really remember what happened and they're confabulating mm. things. This is really interesting when you, yeah, when you pick up on it yeah yeah um, but these are specific entities that you need to know about uh, alcohol chronic alcoholic states and things that accompany alcohol right withdrawal. and the dts are it, it's a big deal dts and um, the other thing treating with benzos there is an alternative yes um, that is infinitely testable and totally fine to use in real life yeah which is, which is phenobarb 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 is great you know, if you've played with it or used it, it's really effective and it definitely is something that's testable for sure. Mm -hmm. So in terms of alcohol withdrawal, there are three phases that have kind of distinct clinical syndromes that go along with it. First, in the very early part, someone's starting to feel anxious. They don't have their GABA agonist on board anymore, so they can't really sleep and they might not start to feel well. And this is often when someone sort of decides, I'm going to stop drinking because I'm not feeling yeah. well. And so then we might, we might see them in that early period. We might see them in the next period, which is stage two, which is the next 24 to 72 hours where their blood pressure starts to go up. They're starting to get a little bit of a fever. They're getting those physiological manifestations. And then you go into stage three, which is like a week out where they're getting the hallucinations and they're seizing and they're really agitated. So these are, you know, they, it takes time to get to these different um, steps. Well, I think that's helpful. So yes. somebody who comes in and they stopped drinking six hours ago and they are really confused and super agitated, that's not DTs. They didn't have time yeah. to get DTs. DTs happens at four to five days. Yeah. Hallucinations can kind of across all of these depending, but the, they tend to be a little bit later. But just know that this timeline from just pure alcohol withdrawal is a pretty predictable timeline. Yeah. And if anything doesn't fit in the timeline, think about something else that might be in, on board. That's important. And you know, in real life, again, these actually these timelines can be difficult to suss out because often patients aren't honest with you about when their last drink was. That being said, at ABEM General, you can believe what they tell you. So if they tell you their last drink was X ago, you can believe it. So I think that's you know important that no one tests they're not trying to trick you. No. Um, they're tr they're, if they're really getting at this type of a question, they'll be honest with you about when the last drink was. Remember to consider alcoholic ketoacidosis and that patient who's got alcohol withdrawal who may have ketones in their urine. That could be something that's going on, that, that type of syndrome. So look for those abnormalities as well. 
When it comes to alcohol withdrawal seizures, classically, seizures happen in that first 12 to 40, 24 hours after the last drink. Now, they can happen up to 48 hours, but it's usually in this sort of time frame. And it's often in the setting of some tachycardia, some mm -hmm. I don't feel so good, some headache, a little bit of tremors, that this seizure starts happens. These are usually short seizures. They're tonic-clonic seizures. It can be multiple seizures in succession, which, but they, it's not status. They should recover between those seizures. Um, but there is a small slice of the pie where they can can go into status from this. And in terms of treating these, good. The good thing is benzos, 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 but don't forget about phenobarb. And if somebody's not responding well to your benzos, but you've given them adequate doses, don't forget about phenobarb. Um, there, there are people who are really big fans of the phenobarb yes, there for are. sure. And, and you're fine. If you're, if you're one of those, you are all good. It's yeah, all fine. It's all fine. Are, combining them can be a little bit of a problem. So you're, usually it's one camp or the other. Yeah. What about the poor? Not for seizures, though. Seizures. Yes. For benzos. seizures, it's benzos. Yes, right. that's absolutely DTs, right. DTs. DTs and withdrawal, you can do both. But that's right. For seizures, don't forget it's benzos. Um, for liver disease and the poor, the poor livers of these patients, now they could be completely fine. They, they could have asymptomatic fatty liver, but they can also have acute alcoholic related hepatitis, cirrhosis, or any combination of that. 30, a third of those patients who just have fatty liver will actually progress on to cirrhosis, but not all of them, but a third of them will. And if they do have alcoholic liver disease, remember that that is not a good thing to have. Their actual mortality in the next five years is upwards of 35%. So it's it actually remarkable. It's, and yeah. we, we kind of get a little bit blasé about this. We do. But it is... Um, having seen not that long ago a young person who had drunk themselves to alcoholic liver disease then come in and die under the uh, age of 30. Yeah. It's like, wow. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it is remarkable. I saw one yesterday that was like 44, you yeah. know, um, and it was in the end stages of this. And there are clues to it. We often, you know, draw LFTs and think about the liver as a consequence of alcohol toxicity over time. But there are non-liver clues as well to alcoholic consequences, which is neuropathy, that stocking mm -hmm. glove neuropathy that people get. They can get cardiomyopathy. We see that a lot too. And then just the malnutrition over time that leads to complications as well. Now, what about screening for unhealthy alcohol use? Certainly relevant, not just to ED care, but primary care as well. And in particular, think about binge drinking. Binge drinking is a bad thing, and most people don't binge drink. Binge drink is something that you know can be can lead you down a path of alcoholism that's pretty bad. And what is binge drinking? What does that mean? And you see some pictures yeah. here. I like these kind of pictures. I do too. I love these. The four glasses of wine, the five frothy beers that they've gotten, um, you know, or just drinking a lot over a period of time. And if that's the case, if you identify that, and often we see that because we they do. they right. end up after that binge drink with not feeling well or the pancreatitis and right. things like that. And actually, uh, to be honest, we see this in our colleagues. Yeah. We see it in our trainees. That's right. Um, it's, it, it's an interesting thing. I, I, I mean, most people don't drink five glasses of wine. Yeah. They'll have two and they'll quit. Yeah. So it is, it is, you see this True. more often than you think even in real life. Yeah. And not just and, the ER. you know, when you go back and ask people who've binge drink in the past, like often nobody said anything about it. No healthcare provider actually mentioned it or did any kind of intervention. So, you know, we have an opportunity again to do something about it. So we should screen for it. We should tell them that's not a good thing to do. And, you know, what can I offer you in terms of resources? It's okay if the person's not that receptive. Again, just the idea of suggesting it might make them think. So, um, you know, do pursue that. So in terms of unhealthy alcohol use, what is one drink? So you have a 12 ounce beer, you have eight ounces of some kind of malt liquor, five ounces of wine, and then you've got kind of the hard stuff. Makes me sad. Five ounces of wine is not very much wine. <laughs> I'm just saying. Yeah. A five ounce it's true. Pour, it's true. It's a little bit. It's true. But, but that's what's considered a that's drink. That's what's considered a drink. Um, and so a validated single question screen that you can use. How many times in the past year have you, for women, had four drinks in a day, or for men, five drinks in a day, and see what you get as a response to that. If it's happened at least one time or more, it's not perfect, but it's got a pretty good sensitivity and spe specificity for an alcohol use disorder, or at least that they're at high risk for that developing. And so it's a pretty good one question if you want to throw in there to ask them. And if that is the question, they say yes to that, well, you know, some more follow-up open-ended questions might be relevant. It's a workup and referral. And we know that if we can do this intervention, if we can engage people in this discussion, we can more frequently be successful in getting someone to think about it, maybe move towards rehab, et cetera. So yeah, and I think what's interesting about this is is if you do ask this it's a super easy question right yeah. somebody comes in intoxicated it's a super easy question to ask one of the things that's kind of interesting about this is just to even say did you know that that the, you know the fact that you partied hard yesterday and you're 
a 19 year old college kid yeah. that this sets you up down the line that maybe just cutting it back for you know just two drinks instead of six yeah you know you might set yourself up for a longer life of just intermittent enjoying alcohol instead of setting yourself up for something that could hurt you that's right so we have an opportunity we often see people with these with this after binge drinking so know that that is a time that we can do something about it now the bad alcohols, the ones now that's like alcohol, that's like our social lubricant, right? <laughs> Ethanol yeah. is just our social lubricant. We yeah. use it for for every, you just party down. Yeah. Um, that people will use other things as substitutes. Now most people who don't drink methanol, they don't go on purpose and drink methanol, Got ethylene no. glycol, or yeah. isopropyl alcohol yeah. on purpose. It's usually a substitute yeah. for getting intoxicated. So they run out of money. They have window Ugh. washer solvent in the garage, and they go drink it's just, that. Instead. It's hard to think about. I can't because I, I, I don't know. Even. These things can't taste good. Ugh. But you know. Anyway. Think about how desperate you'd be to have to right. resort to well, this. Well, and methanol toxicity, it is wood alcohol. You can actually make this. Yeah. You yes. can make methanol. And in fact, one of the biggest batches, like a, a, a massive methanol toxicity, happened in San Quentin prison in the mm -hmm. 1980s or 1990s, where a whole bunch of guys got a hold of, uh, prisoners got a hold of this stuff, and they brought in a, a lot of San Quentin inmates who had gotten methanol toxic from drinking this stuff. So it, it's it's in lots of different things. And the thing about methanol is it is one of the uh, the toxic alcohols. Now this is, ABEM General would love to ask you a question about yes. this. It's something that's on almost every exam, either from the in service up. It's, uh, it's on there because it causes an anion gap acidosis. It's the M of mud piles, right? And it causes an osmolal gap. Um, which is one of those things that now you can you know look at it on your printout it's it's not that hard to calculate an osmolal gap but you need to be aware that it it has an osmolal contribution that isn't measured in anything that we usually measure it's just this thing that's taking up osmolal space that when we calculate what's what's in there it's like well something's holding some osmolal space in there what must be this this something that's a toxic alcohol usually and it's methanol ethylene glycol and isopropyl can all, all do that the thing that's sort of specific to methanol is visual things. So they may come in with the snowstorm. They may come in saying, I'm having trouble seeing. Um, very famous case of methanol toxicity in San Francisco of somebody who was being poisoned with methanol in the freezer in what was supposed to be a vodka bottle. And, and the roommate was poisoning his roommate Ooh. with methanol. And the person came in with visual changes. That was the big clue that something was really weird here. Visual changes with an anti-gap acidosis and an osmolal gap with no known trigger. This is some really smart ER person who put it all together. That is one of the things on, on an ABEM exam that if it's in their stem that somebody's also complaining of some visual changes and they seem intoxicated, hmm, think about methanol. Um, methanol in and of itself isn't toxic. It's, it intoxicates you, but it's not toxic. But as your body breaks it down using alcohol dehydrogenase, it eventually forms formic acid, formaldehyde and then formic acid. And those are toxic to your body. And they're actually inorganic acids, which causes that big, that big ionic gas acidosis. If I decided I wanted to get myself methanol toxic and I, you know, Jan handed me a bottle of what was supposed to be my vodka from the freezer and instead is methanol and I drink it, I'm not going to get sick right now. I'm going to get sick in that metabolism time, which is sort of 12 to 24 hours. So the symptoms are often delayed. And then when they do occur, they're pretty profound. Seizures, respiratory failure, nausea, vomiting, pancreatitis, these visual changes that we mentioned. People can get really, really sick with this. Now, remember, it causes an anion gap acidosis as it's breaking down to this inorganic acid. So it takes a while to get this an anion gap. And you know how to calculate that, or at least look it up on your printout. Or on and here it is screen. for you. Here it is if you want to calculate it. But the osmolal gap, and again, I, I don't think they'll, they'll make you calculate one on ABEM General, but they'll tell you, they'll give you the numbers, and you need to kind of look and figure out that there's an osmolal gap here. And there, this is the calculated osmolality, two, two times the sodium, um, plus the BUN, plus the glucose. Actually, is that right? Yeah. Um, plus, the, uh, calculate the alcohol level. I think the clue is if in the in the stem they're giving you all these values, yeah, it's you like, think, well, like, why are they why telling me all these things? things? And why do I have an <laughs> alcohol level? And why, yeah. yeah. So the key here is to know that if the gap is up, something is taking up that space and it needs to be something that is usually a toxic alcohol. It's methanol, ethylene glycol, isopropyl alcohol. A few other things can, but that's what they're usually getting at for you here. So intoxicated person, visual changes, labs that look, you know, like why am I getting all these weird labs? What the heck are that? And an anion gap, done. We're, we are finished here. Now the way to treat this is to basically block that metabolism of methanol. If I, if I basically keep methanol just as methanol in my body, I'm not gonna end up sick. But as it gets metabolized to formic acid, I will. So this is now that what we do is we block its metabolism at that alcohol dehydrogenase with fomepazole, which is 4-methylpyrazole. Your body likes that better. Um, it won't metabolize the methanol as much. And you can actually eventually excrete 
the methanol in and of itself. If you're super, super sick, you might need dialysis and bicarb. Uh, but but you, here's here's your actual antidote, which is fomepazole. Antidote. Antidote. <laughs> yeah. It is the Toxic. antidote. <laughs> yes, it is the antidote. I will tell you another antidote, though, that's often used just yes. by people who drink methanol is ethanol. So your body likes ethanol better than it likes methanol. And so it will, it will disproportionately go metabolize ethanol while the methanol is hanging out in your body. So people, you can, you, so if you don't have omeprazole at your hospital, yeah. have somebody run across the street to the liquor store, buy a bottle of Jim Beam, bring it back and have the patient take a couple shots of that. Not, I mean, you're not going to do that, but the reality is ethanol, you can give it IV, you can give it orally. Ethanol will, will block that metabolism for a while. It'll shift it over to ethanol and quit metabolizing the methanol. Um, it, again, it's preferably metabolized. So, so to block, so when you're, when you have a, an, an, a, a toxic alcohol, you are going to do three things when you're treat. I would think of it as putting the patient to bed. Um, I'm going to go, I'm going to basically use bicarb if I need to, if they're super, super acidotic. I'm going to use an ethanol or ethanol equivalent from Epazole to block the metabolism. And if things are really terrible, dialysis is the thing I may need to do. So the three things are block the metabolism, get rid of it if you need to with, metab with dialysis, and if they're super acidotic, and remember it's inorganic, you can't metabolize that very well, um, you, you can use bicarb. These people are often a bicarb sink. You'll, yeah. these, are, these are the bicarb levels you get back that are like four. <laughs> yeah, wow. <laughs> what did that happen? How, how is that possible? <laughs> Ethylene glycol toxicity is similar as far as what your body is doing. It's getting metabolized through alcohol dehydrogenase to a toxic alcohol or to a toxic um, acid, an inorganic acid. It gets metabolized. I'll show you that in a second. Um, they present with intoxication, lethargy, coma. But what ethylene glycol does, again, this is antifreeze. This is what your dog can lick up in your garage. So don't let antifreeze get on the floor. They get sick too. Um, what, what happens here is it poisons your kidneys. So these people end up with an anion gap acidosis. Again, they form an inorganic acid, an osmolal gap, because again, this is an alcohol type, you know, it's an alcohol-ish thing in your body that has an osmolal space it contains, it, it holds up. And then you also end up with this pe these people having renal failure. Um, treating this is basically similar. To, again, you block the metabolism and you're good to go. So if omeprazole or ethanol do that, I block the metabolism of ethylene glycol down to oxalic acid that is what kills my kidneys. But I also can use something like pyridoxine and thiamine to help this process as well, as far as just little things that will help make less toxic metabolites down at the end, or end organs there. It's the calcium oxalate that basically poisons your kidneys. Isopropyl is different. So we used to keep bottles of rubbing alcohol at the head of all the beds in the emergency departments because you would take a, a piece of gauze, you would use that and you'd, back before we had individually packaged swab things. And we had it around all the time. You'd clean things up with that, et cetera. But the reason we don't do that anymore is because you can chug that and patients <laughs> would chug that. They would grab it, open it up and chug the, the isopropyl alcohol. The thing about that is you can drink a whole lot of isopropyl alcohol and not die. You can drink a very little amount of methanol or ethylene glycol and die. This does it because it doesn't form an acid. It gets you ketotic as all get out, but it doesn't make you acidotic. So you don't get an anion gap acidosis. And in your mud piles, you're not going to see isopropyl alcohol in there because it doesn't cause an anion gap acidosis. But it will form a ketosis for sure. What people can get from this, besides being intoxicated and having breath that smells like you've just swabbed somebody to start an IV, is they can get a hemorrhagic gastritis. And that can definitely happen. Not common, but can happen. They can get their, sh their sugar to drop, so, that we, they, so just watch their sugars if they're altered. Hypotension can be a problem, pulmonary edema. But honestly, most of the time, they just metabolize this off and they get ketotic and they're good to go. You don't need to give something like fomepazole or um, ethanol because you're not blocking, you don't need to block the metabolism here. It just gets metabolized to a ketone, not to anything that's an inorganic acid and not to something that causes a big acidosis. So we're, we're, we're good here in that regard. So you don't need to give alcohol off, don't need to give bicarb, right? They're not super acidotic. You don't need to give bicarb and dialysis only if they're super severe. I'll tell you, I can't even, I've I mean, that's reportable that. yeah. kind of thing. If it's reportable, you know, it never really happens. So isopropyl alcohol, ketosis, no acidosis. The ethylene glycol and, um, and uh, methanol do cause a profound acidosis. And this is a lovely table. Love it. To put it all in one place. This is a great, by the way, this is one of those things, you know, like star this slide. It's going to be a great slide for you if it's like, I don't know which alcohol is involved here. Oh, their eye findings. It's methanol. Oh, their kidneys are involved. It's ethylene glycol. Oh, they're not acidotic at all. They're just ketotic. Oh, that's got to be, you know, isopropyl alcohol. It's great as far as summarizing the things that we get with the, with the four different alcohols that can hurt you. Yep. So that is ethanol and the toxic alcohols. Yeah. And very a favorite for question writers. It is. Because it's easy to write questions like it's this. It's such a great thing for questions. Yeah.